Hello, welcome to Citizens Forum. It is Wednesday, October the 25th. I'd like to start by thanking the Shaw staff and our volunteer crew who make this community television program possible. Um, and I'll just say that community television is very important. We're losing it in Canada. Um, it's gone in Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, and many, many centers back east. Um, the industry and the Trudeau government and the Harper government before have made it happen. So we're still here in Victoria and some other smaller centers. I'm not sure where it is and where it isn't, but it's on its last legs, which is such a loss for Canada, such because we need a place where we can get some kind of truth outside of what the corporations give us in their media. But anyways, that's enough of that. Uh, the guest in this segment is Isadora Godchild. We're going to be talking about housing to start with. And welcome back. Thank you. So and you want to start it. with the Auditor General's report or start wherever you want? Yeah, well, I just thought I'd get to the Auditor General because I did kind of scratch the surface a little bit on the previous one, but I wanted to get out the fact that uh, I wanted to get out the 1% commentary by Jesse Ventura, as well as, as point out, and I'll top this up as how important community television is. There, it Because it's the only place that ordinary people have a voice and that can that can talk about issues that generally do not get talked about in the mainstream media on a major basis whereas community television you can talk about it quite a bit as long as you want and other people then are, are able to get to see what's going on actually going on anyways yeah so um, so I wanted to, yes, just to kind of wrap things up with the, because we spoke quite a bit about, um, you know, homelessness, lack of affordable housing, the divestment as in offloading, um, subsidized housing. So the, gener the Auditor General's report, which was put out by, um, uh, during the Liberal government, uh, and this was March uh, 2017, and the report highlights were about social housing, which helps people in BC who struggle to find housing, the men's Stream BC housing, which are selling off now the subsidized housing uh, to nonprofits uh, to own and operate, and the ministry, uh, but the ministry does not know if the program will improve the sustainability of the sector of. So the government is ha the government owns subsidized housing buildings, I guess. Yes. Yes. And are there a lot of them? And the land. And the land. Yes, and the are land. Are there a lot of them? Lots and lots and lots of. Uh, and they are now turning those over to non profits. Non profits, exactly. And do the non profits have to buy them? Yes, they do. So they take on a mortgage. They take on a mortgage. Wow. So now, so. What a, what I a know. Trick. So here we get some. We'll get. We'll we'll, um, we'll segue now into a few of the numbers. So it's um, it said it will generate five million from sales to fund 4,000 units and expand rental assistance. Five million? Uh, fifth, uh, 500 million, th thank you. For so they're selling, five, the, the, the provincial government is, the provincial government is selling $500 million um, worth of? No, the five is from the sale. They, are, they will generate 500 million from the sales to fund 4,000 units, whatever, but it says the province is giving nonprofits Thirty million a year to cover the mortgages, and then it says, but mortgage payments add up to one billion over thirty-five years of the program. Don't ask me what any of that means. It just is just like a big, uh, you know. Uh, well, it sort of sounds like subsidized housing that was owned lock, stock and barrel mm -hmm. by the government and quite safe yes. is now out there in the market That's owned by yeah, non groups with no money yes. but large mortgages. L large mo and who knows because you see as with we talked about. Sounds uh, like a plan. It does, doesn't it? Yes. So um, as I'd mentioned in two previous shows before, the, the, uh, the ones I talked about quite a bit was the Stamps Place and the um, uh, Little Mountain. But Little Mountain, Stamps Place did go to the new Chelsea Society, which is a non-profit society. They own tons of uh, other uh, subsidized housing, whatever, but that's now they own um, the Stamps Place. 
and then there was the Little Mountain, but that didn't go to a non-profit society. It went to uh, this uh, a, a Malaysian properties company bought it for big bucks, right? So, and that's 15, 10 to 15 acres. And all kinds of subsidized housing was on that, 224 units on Little and Mountain. And what happened to them? Well, they bulldozed most of it, yeah. See, let's talk about the next thing we were going to talk okay. about, which is the one percent of the one yes. percent. Mm -hmm. I don't think any of this is happening by accident. Mm -hmm. I think a very, very small group of very, very wealthy people completely control all of our governments, mm -hmm. and they're making fortunes out of this. Absolutely and making fortunes. And our, our, our governments don't work for us. There no. is no democracy. No. We elect them, but they work mm -hmm. for the one percent of the one percent of the one percent. I think the democracy is an illusion, really, at this point. We, we, we we're known as a democratic countries and stuff, but I think a lot of it's illusions. You know, yeah, we vote, but as you say, once they're in, they don't work for us. And if we can't turn it around, we see what they're doing. Yes. I mean, they have deliberately created a housing bubble mm -hmm. in Canada mm -hmm. and made fortunes out of it and left millions of Canadians mm -hmm. holding on to this bubble and they can pop it whenever they want. Absolutely, absolutely. And one of the things that uh, the, um, the Auditor General was saying was a, a 2011 study by the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation found that 1.6 million households of all Canada households faced core housing needs. And that their and and that this is their housing was inadequate, requiring major repair, unaffordable, uh, costing more than thirty percent of the household, or un, <coughs> un, unsuitable, um, insufficient number of bedrooms. So the BC has one of the highest rates of core housing need in Canada, with two hundred and forty-seven thousand households unable to find proper housing for these household um, proper housing for the um, and for these households affordability is the most sufficient uh, sig most significant challenge yeah the vicious assault on our society by these people mm -hmm. and their political friends and their friends in the media who never tell the, the story as it really is mm -hmm. uh, you know yeah. it, it, we're just under assault as well, that's Canadians. it. I mean, uh, and and, and we don't see it. Well, and and I mean, how? Um, wh what's the what's the word I'm looking? I mean, it's kind of criminal to think that there are people in uh, Canada, North America, that do not have a roof over their head. That to me is criminal, because in an affluent, abundant society like Canada. Everybody should have, on the very first program that I was on, I had mentioned that there, we, it, there was no homeless. Everything was affordable. Um, uh, nobody, there was no homeless. There was no drug problems. There was no issues like that. When? You know, this was, let me see, when, prior when, to 1975. <laughs> yeah. It you was know, a lot better. Everything was better. Oh, yeah. for I mean, the yeah. vast majority of us. Absolutely, absolutely. So the natives were still getting hammered. Well, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's just coming now that they're getting, you know, um, um, some absolute deserving recognition, right, of that. So, uh, oh, okay. So the and so, the Auditor General also mentioned that uh, the ministry had entered into this program without demonstrating that the sales will result in better outcomes for social housing. But and they will result in better outcomes for somebody. And well, we know who. of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we all know who. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, so, and uh, like I said, once they go into the nonprofit, as I said, previous one, is when they go into the non and the subsidies are divested, rents go up. No doubt about it. Yeah. So, um, so then, there, but then, like I said, I'm a senior citizen, so I would get safer or whatever. But still, we don't know. Will that, in, will, will once they go to, to nonprofits, will that include heat and light like it does now? Who knows, right? We don't know. It's like, a, you know, it's like... Um, we live a, in the second biggest country in the world absolutely. with a population of 35 million people. Mm -hmm. And every natural resource, and yet they, our 
masters and mm -hmm. lords and masters tell us that somehow we can't have enough housing for mm -hmm. the people who live mm -hmm. here. And not only housing, but good housing. Yeah, There's absolutely, absolutely yeah. no reason for it, mm -hmm. except for the fact that the people at the very, very top mm -hmm. are just stealing everything <laughs> they can know, get their hand. Oh, the richest 80, I think it's 86 people mm -hmm. or families, the richest mm -hmm. 86 families in Canada have as much wealth as the 11.4 million people at the bottom at of the, the bottom economic, of rungs at the bottom of, of the society. Economic. Yeah, 80, <laughs> I know. 86 to 11.4 million. It it is a war on us, mm -hmm. and because they own the media, we don't even we, we think it's uh, you know it, it's just the way it is. But it isn't the way it is. Well, in like a prior to 1970, we had a fair society. We had yeah. a fair government generally. I mean, fairer. it wasn't perfect. Fairer, exactly. It wasn't perfect, but at least, like I said, we didn't have homeless people. They just weren't there. They weren't issues. They weren't all these issues. Because there was enough housing. There was so plenty simple. of housing. We've only got maybe three minutes okay. left. Okay, okay. So, all right. So what was that? Okay, so. Somebody has to start a political party. Yeah, yeah. I, and what was it? We were talking about that early and we should, and you said it would be a good thing to call it the Canadian Democratic Party. Or something like or that. Or something like that, right. So, now, last sort of thing was, um, was uh, when the Auditor General was doing this uh, audit and whatnot, it, uh, she states, and it was um, um, Bell Ringer, her name is Bell Ringer. She said, You will see in two places in this report that the government had objected to the disclosure of our findings because, in their view, public interest immunity applies. In other words, they did not want this report, Auditor General report, made public. That was the Liberal government, right? When was it made public? Uh, this was, uh, uh, well, I, it, it was online on March 2017. So it was in the spring, so yeah. A few months ago. Yeah. I don't remember it being a big issue in the media. No, no, you had to dig for this. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. I didn't even know it existed, but a yeah. friend of mine... Because had the people who own the media don't want us to know. It's the, it's the, it's the people who own the media and, and, and they also control the government. That's mm -hmm. it. That's why we don't know about anything, mm -hmm. except we know all about Trump Mm -hmm. and bank, I know, and, and what the Vancouver Auditor Canucks. General insisted that this is definitely in the public interest. Yeah. So at least it got online, if not in <laughs> yeah. the paper, right? Yeah. So at least or it was uh, it was put out. Yeah. So that I haven't finished. So uh, anyways, I guess time is up. Though. I don't know. I think we're still going. Oh, are so, we still yeah, going? Woo! Going. Okay. Woo! <laughs> Sometimes I feel I have to talk like this because I know how time is so. <laughs> okay. So um, oh yeah, um, so one of the. Um, uh, one of the visions I had for people who are living like uh, low-income housing that have mental issues and drug problems and stuff like that is that you, it's one thing to give them a roof over their head, which is, which is definitely what they need, but it's another thing to say, give them like um, little jobs to do or interests or skills where they can actually involve themselves in the place that they live and that way because I mean basically giving them just a roof over their head to continue on with their drug addiction is not yeah. putting them forward. No, we need like a society. Well community. that's it, yeah exactly and so you know little jobs to do and you know and skills, give them some skills you know or, or uh, enhance the skills they have and that they can be a part of the Could community. Could be so much where better. Oh, absolutely. But we can't afford it because well. all the money's up there. <laughs> right, and, the, and then all goes to... I we are out of time. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just so we were getting to the good part. Isadora, thank you very much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back to Citizens Forum. Uh, today we have with us Mehdi Najari, and Mehdi's... Uh, uh, researcher and a public policy analyst and we're going to talk about uh, the decision that uh, the, the BC government is now facing whether or not to proceed with the Site C dam and Mehdi has come with us today to look at the overall issues that are that we're faced with in British Columbia with BC Hydro and the problems that this government is facing to try to figure out what to do with BC Hydro. So welcome to the show, Mehdi. Thank you, Walter. So I think, firstly, <clears throat> we have to look at how we got here. And I think we'll start back, say, 10 or 15 years. The Liberals have been 
in power about that long and look at their behavior and what has brought us to the point now where uh, we're basically in a crisis financially in British Columbia with BC Hydro and uh, what are our options in the future? See, the, the agenda, liberal agenda, liberal government agenda has been the corporate agenda. The corporate agenda is to privatize publicly, public assets, public entity like BC Hydro, like BC Rail. We saw, for example, BC Rail was in very good economic condition in middle of 19, 1990s. And at one point, they were contemplating to buy CN, Canadian Nationals, from... Yeah. from and uh, for, uh, when, when the liberal came to power, between 1991 to 1994, they, uh, uh, they, uh, 2001 to 2004, right. they destroyed BC Rail from within right. and created a huge debt for it and then gave it away in a fire sale to the, to the, to the CN, a, a private company by then, right. for nine, 999 years, yeah. and we got nothing out of it. So they basically gave away a very valuable yes. public asset. So what they did with BC Hydro was first they came and they carved away one third of BC Hydro operation and gave it to Accenture. Yeah. You know? And then they created the BC Transmission Corporation, carve up the transmission, transmission lines of the BC Hydro and give it to another, se separate that. Yeah. in order to allow the private power producers access to the grid in North American grid right. through the transmission lines. And then they prohibited BC Hydro to produce any energy in future except C Dam. They exclude C Dam. But all the energy production has to be uh, through the private power producers, right. they said. I mean, who does that? You know, yeah. why, why are you doing this? For whose interest? This is only help corp corporate interest against public interest. Yeah. And then they went and have 20 to 40 years contract with the private power producers yeah. to buy energy from them for even megawatt hours between 85 to 125 dollars, yeah. while the BC Hydro were producing the same energy for 24, 25 uh, So we're dollars. paying... Uh, three or four times the rate that we that hydro could generate themselves by paying these private uh, to, power producers. To private power producers. So they gave the rivers, the run of the rivers yeah. to these private corporations. So now they are generating power yeah. and nobody is going to buy the, the amount they are demanding, you know, for, yeah. the, for the, because it's way over market price. But, but the BC government the liberal government signed those contracts, you know, and opposition was, didn't make a, a big fuss about it. They were com compliant yeah. opposition. And now we are paying huge amount, two to three times over the market price to this, uh, to this so-called private power producer. And yeah. they are, because they are run of the river uh, yeah. power, they are hydropower, they produce power at the time that we don't need. Right. You know, is, uh, because we have so much uh, dam power from yeah. uh, uh, public dams, you know, we don't need that. So now we came to a point that there is so much surplus of power that we pay these private power producers not to produce energy. Oh, that's like salt in the wound, isn't it's, it? It's like, a, it's like a giving a money tree to these corporations and they are just, uh, they are just uh, getting money for nothing. Yeah. Now, the thing is, is that <clears throat> why aren't the taxpayers and why aren't the, pu and the public squawking about that? How are they able to hide this financial arrangement? We have, we have to see what else the BC government and BC Hydro done. First of all, BC Hydro has been corrupted from within. Yeah. Why I am saying that? Because for last 40 years, BC Hydro overestimating the, uh, yeah. the power needs. You can overestimate once or twice, but you cannot consistently overestimate bec because that is not a mistake, that's yeah. intentional. While they are overestimating, they are creating a huge, uh, uh, they want to build more, but they say we need more dams, more energy. So they have to spend a lots of public power, uh, public money to, uh, to create this infrastructure like Site C Dam, which yeah. we don't need. Yeah. Because it showed that right now we are, we are 
paying the private power producer not to produce. But yeah. in order for us not to feel the effect of these policies, you know, they are, they are creating this fraudulent accounting system. For example, deferral account. Billions of dollars that we have to pay now and it's going to increase the rate of hydro rate for, for yeah. us if, they will, if we pay right now. They are deferring it for future. So instead of we pay, we are allowing the BC Hydro continue this mismanagement yeah. and our children will pay dearly for it. But does that show up on the hydro's books as, as debt? Uh, not, 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 for, not for today. Yeah. It's a deferral account. Yeah. They, so deferring the, 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 the cost of all this infrastructure they, they are building. Yeah. And in fact, they are deferring the, uh, the effect of bankrupting BC Hydro for future. Because they're never going to be able to, to make enough money to actually pay the yes. bill. Let, let me tell you this. In 2004, the BC Hydro debt, the total debt of BC Hydro was around six billion, six point seven billion dollars. Yeah. By 2014, it went to sixteen point seven billion. So they created all these through the run of the river project contract through the <coughs> federal account, and by 2019, the 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 total short-term and long-term debt of BC Hydro will be around to $21.8 billion. Right. The question is, how are we going to pay for that? Is there any report to indicate that the people are going to pay for this comfortably? Yeah. The rate of the hydro rate is going to increase tremendously. And yeah. by that time, they are going to come. This is what they have done in third world country. The book... Uh, the Confession of Economic Hitman by John Perkins show how they were doing it to go persuade the leaders of the third world country to borrow money yeah. to build infrastructure that they, they, they didn't need. And, they, and these companies, these American companies that were, uh, were participating in this infrastructure so-called uh, building, they knew they are not, these countries are not going to be able to pay. So yeah. what's happened? They bankrupt these, these, these uh, countries yeah. and took over the assets and the resources of those countries. Now, John Perkins is writing a new, uh, a new version of his book, you know, a new addition to his book, and he's saying that now he's saying in the last 12 years, they are doing exactly what they were doing in third world country. They are yeah. doing inside the United States or Canada or Western country. They are creating debt for public. And by doing that, you are going to bury us with debt, you know. And then, what's happened? They are going to come after, like in like in uh, Detroit, they went after public assets. Yeah. They are going to come after public assets, and after sometimes, you are going to go after our taxes. Yeah. You are going to say we are we are so much in debt that we cannot I increase education budget or or healthcare budget. We have to give money to, our, to, our, to fix our debt, and then there goes our society. This, yeah. is, this is intentionally they are doing, and I, I always thought this is intentional mismanagement for the last 30 years that I have been in this country. But then in 2010, I got a, uh, I, I got a, a copy of a government document. This is executive role profile. This is public service of B British Columbia, BC public service. And in that, they are saying that what kind of executive they would like to hire. This is what they say. Executive anticipate and are prepared to institute change quickly at times to capitalize on best opportunity. Executive create a crisis to force change. So they are saying that public managers of the different uh, public uh, uh, right. department should create crisis to force change. This I'm, sounds like the Naomi Klein analysis, the shock doctrine. Shock doctrine, exactly. And the question is, what kind of policy you want to implement that you have to create crisis in order to force people a change that they, they, they don't like? They otherwise would never agree to. Uh, agree to. So, yeah. so we have corrupt 
corrupt public service. They corrupted the public service. Yeah, you know, I just read the first sentence in this in this document. It says, executives play a pivotal role in leading organizations in the execution of government strategic corporate agenda. So the very first sentence tells us that these executives are there to carry out the corporate, corporate agenda. agenda. This is their own document. Yeah, I like mean, why would they put that on the on a website? It's stunning. It's such a betrayal of the public trust when we would expect that the bureaucracy in the government is there to implement policies and carry out policies for the good of the of The, the reason country. they put it there, see there is a, you know there is two philosophical argument between uh, between uh, George Orwell. Yeah. And uh, and uh, all those Huxley, Huxley was saying that in future they are going to control our society by putting so much information, dumping so much information on us that we cannot sift through misinformation uh -huh. and 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 uh, misrepresentation yeah. and misdirection and facts. So they are burying us with so much information. Yeah. Uh, George Orwell was saying that they are going to do censorship. I think they are doing both of those. They are yeah. doing censorship. Of, of the issues by having the corporate media controlling what people can hear and what they cannot. Yeah. And on the other hand, they are burying us with so much information that right now people, because they are busy to make a living, to feed their children and put a roof over their head, yeah. they don't have time to sift through these information no. to see if they need site C or doesn't, don't need no, site C. No, it's gone to the, we've got about one minute left, so I just want to ask you this question. <coughs> the, um, the new government in British Columbia, the NDP uh, slash Green government, uh, has uh, submitted the issue to the BC Utilities Commission and put put the Site C Dam construction under um, review. Uh, do you think it's possible that the BC Utilities Commission can have enough information that they can actually make recommendations. I think BC Utility Commission are going to look at the economy and say that this is, is disaster for future of the BC, and is already the, one of their main main point was if this project is on target and on budget because BC Hydro were telling us until October fourth that it is on on time and on budget. Yeah. Now we find out through freedom of information request that it's $600 million over budget and will be one year delay. So it's not on time, it's not on budget. The, uh, the Duluth, Duluth uh, auditors look at this for BCUC and said that the project maybe cost 12.5 billion, not 8.7 billion. I believe this, this is gonna cost the FBC site C, this betrayal continue, is gonna cost over 16, 17 billion dollars at least, because yeah. everywhere, in uh, the, the, the budgeted for uh, in in site C is budgeted for 8.7 billion. Muskrat Falls was budgeted for five, uh, 6.4 billion. It's ending up to be 12.7 billion. Their their cost. The same is going to be true with site C dam. This is the project of bankrupting BC Hydro. I hope the BC uh, NDP and the Greens will not go and uh, support this and uh, stop this real betrayal of public. Okay, thank you very much, Mehdi, for bringing that in to us. So that completes this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. Uh, we're going to be talking about a few things that's happened uh, around the world and in, in our town for the next few minutes. Uh, Welcome to the show, Jack. I know you're sitting on the other chair now. Um, and we just generally bring in articles and, and, and issues that we think the, the public should be thinking about. And, and, uh, and we're just trying to help people figure things out. Um, should I start, Jack? Please do. Because I, I just clipped an article uh, from the Times columnist today. Uh, the yeah. Minister of Forest, Lana Popham, comes under fire over fish lab probe. Front now, page? The front page of the Times columnist. Now, what's interesting is that when you read the article, there's actually there's no, nothing really to sink your teeth into, that there really isn't much of a controversy. There was a, uh, a scientist within the, uh, the Ministry of, uh, I guess, is, uh, of the D, uh, DFO, which it stands for Department, Department of Fisheries and Oceans, that expressed concerns and uh, that uh, some things had not been done properly in a, in a lab that the government was relying on for testing. In fact, there was problems, there was uh, 
infections being caused by farm salmon to uh, wild salmon, and they seem to have s just sort of fudged the figures a little bit to, to not allow that to come out, from what I understand. So anyway, uh, th what I would like to say about this is that we have the Minister of Agriculture. She's doing her job. We know, Jack, from all the years of reading about this, and if one looks at the Alexandria Morton site, uh, what is the name of her website? No, I can't remember. Uh, Salmon or Sacred, is that it? Something like that, but we're going to put a website up for that. Just look at the evidence. It's overwhelming. Fish farming is devastating to the British Columbia fisheries and to the wild salmon. Everybody knows that, but still the TC chooses to report this in a way that the minister seems to be not doing her job properly. Popham comes under fire. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. under fire. It's pretty it, strong. It's the tone of the article yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is that there's some issues there with how she's working, how she's doing her yeah. job. But well, in fact, that's, she's the, that's the power of the media. That's right. To control us yeah. and to control our governments. And if we cannot get past that, yeah. uh, it should be taught in school. You know, don't, don't, don't trust. I mean, they have an interest. Yeah. It's the corporate world. They're into fish farming, just like they're into everything else. They're one horrendous entity that uh, seemingly will stop at nothing. To As Mehdi just pointed out yeah. in the earlier yeah. interview. That and the media is just a part of it. That's right. The public service is there to, to promote the corporate agenda. They just say that right out. Well, how about us? How about the public? How about the people that pay are paying the We are totally irrelevant. Checks? We are totally irrelevant to them. Yeah. They sit up there in their, wherever they are, on their yachts and, and, and in their m yeah. billion dollar homes now probably. 84 families, 84 or 86, 86 yeah. families at the, the 86 richest families in Canada have the same amount of wealth as the 11.4 million people at the bottom. Um, they run the country. Yeah. They run the country for their benefit. They, and, and of course, uh, their friends around the world. Yeah. They're destroying the environment. They're destroying our society. Yeah, and the other article I brought in is uh, something I just saw in the news uh, last night. Uh, the CBC covered uh, Donald Trump, as they do every night. Uh, but Trump's allowing uh, the JFK files to now be open for the first time after how many years is it? We've 53 years or something? Yeah, something like that. Now, and, and, and again, it's the tone of the coverage. Uh, it was something like they said anyone who questions uh, the official story or tin hatters or believe in aliens or something like that. So I did a little bit of research today. I looked at on the internet and see, looked at some credible web, websites. Uh, in, in 2013, no less than 62% of Americans said they believe that there was a broader plot beyond just having Lee Oswald on the sixth floor overlooking Daly Plaza shooting the president. So 62% of Americans think there was some type of conspiracy. It doesn't matter. But our CBC, is saying, oh, they're, they're tin hatters and, and, and there's something wrong with the way they're thinking. You know, and the thing is that we have Trump allowing this to come out, so they're discrediting this by, by saying, well, if Trump allows it to come out, there's got to be something wrong with it. But the thing is, is if you actually look at the actual substance of, their, of what's happening, this is very credible. There are some very serious, very, very serious questions that should be asked about the JFK assassination and looking into who actually was involved. Now, Trump had mentioned uh, t Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz's dad is Rafael Cruz, who was a Cuban who lived in, in Cuba, who, f who left Cuba two years before the revolution. He worked for an American corporation, had very close ties with the CIA, and uh, Ted Cruz's father, as Trump had claimed, was in Dallas, Texas, and in New Orleans in 1962, and appeared to have been involved in some of these activities. So this is not something that's being dreamt up. In fact, this was, in fact, happening. There's no question, really, that the whole, the whole story has been covered up, again, by the media. They just, yeah. they, they, 
they haven't talked about it since the day it happened. They've never asked the questions. It's always making, poking, and it works. Yeah. It works. People, it works, but. Well, you know, there was a, there's a series that I've watched a couple of times now called The Men Who Killed Kennedy, and we're going to have a, a URL for people to go to that. Uh, and uh, and to look at this this evidence was overwhelming, so well documented in nine segments of who was involved in the assassination, and uh, how Kennedy was assassinated. In fact, how he was shot. The bullet that killed Kennedy was well documented through ballistics, where where it came from, and uh, how it struck him in the head and, and killed him. Uh, it's never been talked about in the mainstream media, but the scientific evidence is overwhelming that they know how Kennedy was shot, and it wasn't by Lee Harvey Oswald. The one thing that I always tell people to think about is the one fact in that series that always struck me was uh, there was one fingerprint left in the Texas Book Depository at that window. And that fingerprint was from a guy by the name of Malcolm Wallace. And Malcolm Wallace was a known hitman for... for uh, Lyndon Johnson and uh, you would have to see the series to, to see the validity of me calling him a hitman because in fact he did kill people and he claimed he killed them for Johnson his fingerprint was in the Texas Book Depository that day Left, uh, they took those, those prints and if you think about what that really means that a close associate of Johnson's was left a fingerprint at that window Oswald's fingerprints were never found there so uh, Kennedy, my understanding is Kennedy fired the head of the CIA. Yeah. Right? He didn't want to go into the war in Vietnam. Yeah. He wanted uh, a detente, a peace with Russia. Yeah. He had a battle going on with the Federal Reserve over he interest wanted, rates. He wanted to have the U.S. government create its own money through its own central bank yeah. instead of the Fed, which is a private bank, doing it because control of the money supply is paramount. That's why Canada is in debt because the private banks have taken over our national bank as well. Kennedy did not want that. Yeah. There were, they actually started printing money. That's and, correct. And he, there were so many reasons for them to kill him. And it just shows the power that they have. And they still have it. I think 9-11 was exactly the same. But to me, what's striking is the CBC, our broadcaster, you know, people that have the skills to do the research, people that can sift the wheat from the chaff and understand what are the real facts and what aren't facts, can easily see in this case that there's no doubt there was a conspiracy that killed John Kennedy as well as his brother and at Martin least Luther the King. questions are there to be asked. And you know the thing is, is that when when there anybody that asks questions, and I always say this, it's okay to ask questions. But it's, it's not. okay to wonder. It's not. Anybody anybody anywhere in the CBC or the corporate owned media in this country who really wanted to push those stories and look boss, look at look at this, look what I've got, they would be out of the industry yeah. within days. Now you can make a mistake. And you can say, I want to do this, but you better learn very quickly that you're not going to do it. Yeah. Certain things are not allowed to be said, and, and this is one of them. You know, the real journalism is happening in the blogs online. Um, we're going to have a couple of websites up there. It's just very, very good, uh, very analytical websites that look at evidence and how it's presented. But the uh, corporate media still has so much power. Well, they do. I, I think in the end is, is uh, to me, is like uh, they can continue on down this road because they have nowhere else to go. I mean, it, why are we talking about John Kennedy being shot in 1962? It's because the same people are in power today, Jack. The same interests and the same individuals, many of them, are still around. A few. Well, some of them are, st are still around. And... Uh, uh, the Bush clan is still around, and they have had a lot to do no with But there's no question that the, the rulers, yeah. the ruling elite, the people have changed, the faces have changed, but it's still the ruling elite, and it's no 
more interested in democracy or freedom or anything else than it was back then. They want power and control. And they yeah. got it. Well, many times it's passed on down, like uh, Prescott Bush, George Bush Sr., George Bush Jr., Bill Clinton. They're Should all. You mentioned Prescott Bush. I mean, the yeah. fact that, that, I mean, everybody in the country should know the story of Prescott. Prescott Bush was the father and grandfather of the two presidents, Bush. He was involved in a bank that in the 1920s was funneling money to Adolf Hitler and the Nazis to get them started. This is not conjecture, this is historic fact. And if you Google yeah. Bush, Hitler, and Guardian, you'll see the story in the Guardian newspaper that talks about it. The fact that we don't know this shows the disastrous state we're in. Well, in fact, half of the funding to the Nazis came from the West, and much of it came through that bank. And when that, when that funding shut down, of course, the Nazis are in trouble. You know, the war was going to end because they were running out of money and running out of resources. But the thing is, again, we're just in a situation now where we have to keep asking the questions and, and really demanding answers. And we have to, of course, uh, have a government that, that will represent our views and represent honesty and integrity and all the things we want. And uh, we have to do that by continuing to participate in, in, in the process and not to set back and just let it all happen and be intimidated and, and be afraid to speak up because uh, bullies like the CBC are going to call you a tin hat or, or conspiracy theorists. We just have to ignore that and just take that for what it is and just keep asking questions, keep participating. Yeah. So have you brought anything in, Jack? <laughs> yeah, There's, I hate to pick. I hate to pick on the TC, because you know it's it's no different than any of the rest. But yeah. this was a story. Shelters face a growing dilemma, and I mean the whole story is about trouble in our city between the homeless and the communities that that they're being pushed into by the federal government, the provincial government, and the city government. And they never talk for one second about why we have homelessness. It's, yeah. it's, they just pit one against the other. But the reason we have the homelessness is because it's just another part of the plan. They've deliberately underbuilt housing in our country, and we're out of time. We're out of time, is correct, Jack, and maybe we'll talk about that in the next show. So that completes uh, this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It's the last segment. Um, it's Wednesday, October the 25th. I'd like to thank again the volunteer crew and Shaw staff that makes the program happen. Uh, the guest in this segment is William Goldeet. Hello, William. Thank you, Jeff. And we're going to be talking about society and civil society. Um, maybe we all have a different picture in our mind of what that means, but away we go. Yeah, uh, civil society. Uh, I think it is important that uh, the recognition of civil society is very important, especially in our community here. I come from South Sudan, or Sudan, that time before a division of the country into two countries in 2011. So in my countries, now I'm Canadian, of course. Uh, Land is for people. Every citizen have equal right to have a piece of land to build a home. At the same time, you have equal right to have a piece of land for cultivation, for crops or vegetable, and you have water where you can fish for your food, and you have a forest where you can go for hunting. So those are the basic need for the people. How we got to have a land, back home, you have to take a stone and throw it. Where your stone landed, that would be your land. Now, we have a war 
and the neighbor bought a hub to run out from country into an other world, like myself in Canada. So in Canada here, when I get here, I have a hope that life would be better here. But it is shocking. Well, is with disbelief that in Canada, you have people today who are living in a the street. They don't have home. In Canada, a country, I think is a continent, we have like 30 million people. Maybe 35 million people. Second biggest country in, in the world. In the largest country in the world. People are renters that are asleep, renting. Why? And we have a vast land. What is going on here? Well, the why is, I guess, that as we've talked about in the earlier parts of this program, the 1% of the 1% have so much wealth that there's just so little left over. Like in Germany, they have a lot of co-op housing. And it's not expensive. You, you own it, but when you move out, you lose your ownership, that's all. And it's, it's run by the co-op. It seems to work very well in Germany. They have, um, but here, you know, it's, it's a difference. It's all corporate. It's all for profit. And it's working very well for some, but for a growing number of Canadians, it's not working very well. That's the mess we're in. Yeah. So that and other things which is going on around us as Canadian is a health issues. You have many Canadians who are dying while waiting for medical appointment. Yes. And you have people who are going for medical uh, service overseas. Yeah. Other thing is the water here. Yes, we are okay, we have a clean water in Canada, but there are people, Canadian, who don't have access to the clean waters, you know. This is what I said, that uh, like, as a Christian in the Bible, he said, the member of the body, if one of them is in pain, and then the whole body is affected. It's very true. So we cannot be happy while other Canadian, they are not happy somewhere or our own, uh, or at the backyard, for example, the First Nation, they don't have a clean drinking water, you know. So, I agree with you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We shouldn't, you know, it, it bothers me every day as I'm walking around. It just infuriates me. The, the for one thing, the homeless people, that the leaders of our country deliberately create this mess for for people to have to be living on the street it's it just and and yet there's nothing to be done it just goes on everybody says it would be every, whenever they do a study the study always finds the same thing it would be cheaper to build homes for the homeless put them into homes and take care of them than it is to do what we're doing now which is an absolute nightmare for everybody but our leaders won't do it. They won't let us do it. That's the mess we're in. Yeah, and also uh, uh, we have uh, a big problem also uh, in regard of, uh, of, you know, that's why I'm coming to the point of uh, civil society. Why do we need it, you know? Uh, we have issue with uh, legislations. For example, we have a previous government, as one example, under a Stephen government, the immigration legislated that when you are newcomer to Canada, you are here four years out of five years, and then you can apply for citizenship. 
you need to have English. You need to be uh, 30, 65 years, so you will be exempted from taking English tests or something. All right, over 65? Yes. You don't. Yeah. No, the new government under Justin came again and took it back again. Three years instead of four years. How much money it costs Canadian for sitting in the parliament changing laws? The laws is for people. The government goes, and the, but the people remain. If the laws the government legislate is for the people, no matter which government did it, the new government should not put the hand on, the, like what is going on in America today. Obama did something, but because he's Obama and Trump have to move everything he did, you know, and it cost the taxpayer a lot, you know. Uh, we have, for example, we have a case recently where the Canadian institution can wrong the Canadian citizenship. One of them is Omar Carter's. He's a victim of, you know, being irresponsible. So there are individuals in the office who did that. Now who have to pay that is the Canadian people. Omar got 10 million and a half dollars. But there is no question. Who did what? That's Who is accountable question. for that? Yes, yes, yes. We need to know what, what goes wrong. Yes, yes. How he become the victim. Yes. And who did what? This is what we need to know. No, we don't know what we happened, know. but only pay him money. Yes. So we are the victim. And he is the victim. You see? And he is a victim. But somebody who did something there, we don't know who. You know? So that's why I'm saying it is important the civil society participation to monitor the government activities because we elect the government we send them to do what we want them to do for us we are employers for them but we need to monitor them and instead of giving them the power and then they remain in the office for four years and we wait for another election another government come in and did the damage, we wait for another year and they come back again. I think the participation of civil society in monitoring the government, the way they implement uh, their policies, is very important. I, I agree, and I even, th I mean, it's something we never talk about in Canada. The story here, we're told, is, well, you elected them and wait till the next election and kick them out. But that's not democracy. Democracy would be, as you say, that we are always watching them because we don't elect them to be our kings and queens. We just elect them to do what we want them to do. But they don't. And we have to watch over them exactly. and control them. I don't know how to do it, but it's definitely doable. And we should really start to focus on people power, not politician power. You know, the collusion between the civil society to just oversee the government, you know? And I know when they are in the parliament, we give them authority to speak on our behalf. But they can mess up, <coughs> you know? So if they fail to do what they're supposed to do, and then we have a right to monitor them. I think we can impeach the president to move the, the president from the office. The Congress or Parliament can do that. People can impeach the, 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 their member. We don't need to wait for a, a full four years to come. So if the civil society start mobilization, or let's say it, many different civil society, they come together and have a kind of citizen dialogues where we can do the public education about the way we are being governed by our own people, you know. What do we expect from them? We can create awareness in the society. And when the society are aware, 
of what the government should do and what they should not do, I think that is the connection between the government and the people. And then they will be held accountable quickly when there is something not going well, you know. And instead of electing them to the office and then we wait for another four years. Yeah. yeah. What we have now is not working. So we've got to regain control of our democracy. It'll take time and effort and money. Um, but I think we'll all be better off for it. And I think we'll all be happier for it too. And we'll have the society that we want more rather than the society that the 1% of the 1% want. And we'll be more out of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Thanks for watching this week.